decay great. So the uh, the minion was first in our hands in, in June uh, last year. So it's it's been a year, pretty much a year, to the uh, to the day that this has been this has been out in the wild, and. Uh, we were obviously very excited about this because it had been quite a long time in the coming. No one really knew what the what the performance of this device was actually going to be. We quite a few numbers had been banded around. Um, Oxford Nanopore had been uh, saying that they were going to weren't going to release the device until it was delivering an acceptable level of performance. So everyone was kind of excited to see what what we were going to get out of it. And uh, we uh, kind of had a meeting and decided that. There's lots of people on this program. Everyone's going to be doing, wanting to do quite similar things. And we wanted to focus on these particular unique properties of the device. So firstly, the fact that it's real time. So once you load a sample to this, it streams data off in real time. So it's, it's very different from, from the kind of batch mode sequences that, we're, that we typically use, like the Illumina MySeq and things like that. Um, it's also uh, portable, evidently. It's it's very small. It's uh, battery powered, so it doesn't it doesn't really uh, need much infrastructure. You can run it from this, from a from a kind of uh, laptop. It has to be quite a powerful laptop. It needs an SSD, but um, a normal laptop, and it generates very long reads. And initially, we didn't really know what what the, what kind of read length that we were going to get out of it. But it pretty much has turned out that whatever you can get into it you can sequence. The longest read to date is about 200 KB generated by um, this chap John Urban who's really into the into the long reads. So the first thing we we kind of did was we sequenced the kind of pet organism of every lab, uh, E. coli K12. We, we, the, reason we kind of, we, the reason we did this is because there'd been we, we'd had quite a lot of Success early on, there used to be this kind of chart which showed the the, uh, the kind of the amount of data that each lab had generated. It was kind of a league, and everyone was kind of vying for the top for the top places in the league. And uh, we we had we had a couple of good runs, so we thought we would we would put it out there um, as a community resource and and see what people uh, could make could do with that data. Tip, we were kind of targeting. The bioinformatics and, and the kind of com computer science groups that didn't actually have their own minions, but this is clearly going to be um, a very, very much very amenable to development of new algorithms. So we wanted to provide that community resource. So we sequenced K12. Um, the original chemistry that was launched last June was called R6, and it was very quickly uh, followed by R7 and then R73. So R7 is a different generation of pore to R6. And then R73 is the late, in, in also incorporated the latest membrane material, which was which are all you know all things to improve the accuracy and signal to noise of the of the platform. So we we released two runs in this, two data sets for this paper, an R7 uh, data set and an R73 data set. So this uh, this this is kind of a collector's curve of the data. So you can see that in this run, we ran this one for 60 hours and this one for uh, 40 hours and generated about 40,000 reads in both cases. These inflections here uh, are caused by adding a new kind of dose of library to the sequencer. So you can see it kind of gives it a bit of a boost. And I did um, two, three, three top ups in that one and just one in that one. And this is a histogram of the, of the read length that we got. So you can see that uh, there's some very very long reads up to about 30 40 thousand in the sample but the majority of them are you know around around about 10 KB so it was definitely delivering on the read length promise so we we, we wanted to investigate what the accuracy of this was and uh, people in on the map which was the the online forum where people talk about what they've been doing uh, and and the results they've got quickly realized that this this uh, this kind of not particularly uh, well used aligner called LAST was really good at, at aligning these nanopore reads and we had to play around with the uh, the different kind of uh, penalties and this is the top panel here is the R7, is R7 data set and the uh, this is the 
R73 at the bottom, and the first column is using a mismatch penalty of 1 and a mismatch penalty of 2. And you can see that the R7 has a kind of accuracy of about 75 something percent for the full 2D and uh, you know around 60 for the individual 1D template uh, 1D um, base calls so so the way that the the way that the nanocore works is you, you put in double stranded DNA with a hairpin on it and it reads it in one direction and then it reads it in reverse in the other direction. So the, the, the kind of blue color there is, is the, uh, the complement and the green is the template. So that's the two individual single um, strands. And then if, you, if, if, if everything <coughs> works and you get what's called a, um, a full 2D read, then it will combine the two, the two, uh, two signals to create a 2D base call. And those are the those are the ones you really want, and a lot of the initial problems with the with the <coughs> difficulties getting this to work were the number or the percentage of these kind of two D reads that you could actually get, which meant you had a successfully ligated the hairpin and you had successfully um, bound the motor protein to that hairpin. So the reason the distinction between normal normal two D and full two D um, is that there's a there's an enzyme on one end which drives the strand through and then once it goes around the hairpin because there's only single stranded there it would actually uh, increase it would it would go through even faster on this on the complement <coughs> strand so there's a second protein which kind of acted as a kind of break uh, and in order, and and that one was was very sticky and causing problems so there was quite a lot of development early it, uh, early on um, trying to generate these these full 2d reads which are the kind of desirable reads and actually mostly the only ones that you would actually analyze so we, we could see that, uh, that there was a, an effect of the aligner parameters here, so, uh, and that was, that, was, that was kind of interesting. And, and later on, I'll talk a bit, uh, a bit about Mark Akerson's group developed a, a method of, you know, of kind of removing some of this uh, aligner dependency to give you the, true, the, the, best, the best estimate of the true error rate. So you have to remember, this is, this is very much like uh, the other single molecule sequencing technology on the market, which is PacBio, which generates... Mm -hmm. Raw read qualities, uh, raw read accuracies of about eighty-five percent, uh, and so quite similar. It's quite similar to the, to the nanocore. The data are actually quite similar, um, but the consensus of the of those um, of those raw reads is actually quite good, because the main error mode, which is missed events, which cause deletions, um, consensus out over over uh, when you have more coverage. I'll talk a bit more about that later. So. Um, we want to exploit the the the, the, the property of, of the of the instrument, which was that for the first, which was that it generates stream data. So if once a molecule is traversed through the pore, it generates a file. That file is there, available, ready to analyze, a full read. Uh, so it's it's different from the kind of cycle by cycle uh, sequencing, where you actually get full length reads, um, you know, in real time. And uh, around last June, there happened there happened to be a timely outbreak of salmonella in, in uh, our local hospital, Heartlands. So we, we, uh, we, wanted to, uh, we wanted to see if you could use the Minarn usefully in, in this kind of outbreak investigation. So we got the first 16 samples driven down to us. So this was during the outbreak. It was still ongoing. Um, and these are MySeq results. So I put them on the MySeq, uh, the first 16 samples. We analysed um, 13 there using uh, a draft sequencing method. So we um, hacked up the MySeq recipe to get 1x75 sequencing in six hours so that, so that we could get the information as quickly as possible. And that, was, uh, that was purely by kind of cutting down the, you know, the, the times that are used for the, for the MySeq chemistry because they are, they're designed for to deliver good quality for 300 base reads, so you can, if you only want, if you only need 1x75 base reads, like for something like mapping and SNP calling, then you can get away with very fast sequencing. I actually think you could probably get it down to about two minutes a cycle if you wanted to. Um, and then later on, in further runs, we then did 24 samples, and at the end of the outbreak, 41 samples. And we could see that we were indeed dealing with an outbreak. We had out of the initial 13, we had 10 identical, uh, we had 10 indistinguishable uh, isolates. So we knew that we were dealing with an outbreak scenario. That this wasn't just a this wasn't just a, a, a more more than background level of salmonella cases, and 
we integrated our data that we'd got from the MySeq with the surveillance sequencing, which um, the Gastro Group at, Col at PHE Colindale do. Uh, they have a it, they sequence all referred um, cases of Salmonella, and we put them we integrated it to their data set, and they f they found out that they using using this method that there were some quite closely related cases from um, London uh, from the previous month and then all of these ones at the bottom are associated with the outbreak in, in Birmingham so it looked like it was part of an ongoing national outbreak and we decided to take one outbreak case and one unrelated <coughs> non-outbreak case which we had also uh, picked up uh, on the Minion so this is going back to what I was talking about earlier. You start, in order to make your minion library, you start off with your genomic DNA and you shear it to your desired size, so about 5 to 10 KB. And then you have to add on this hairpin, which has got that brake motor on it, and this, this leader adapter here, which has got the, the actual ratchet enzyme in, and that's the kind of ratchet enzyme sitting atop the pore there. And what you want to happen is the end threads into the pore and then it pulls the uh, DNA through first the template strand goes around the hairpin and then goes back through the complement strand and this little blue thing here is there's actually one on the other end as well is a tether it's a cholesterol tether which sticks the molecule to the surface of the membrane which is uh, increases the efficiency it's, it increases the chance of you of a, of, a, of, a, of a molecule coming into contact with the pore at any time which increases your throughput and we can do this in about, ambitiously, I say, 90, in about 90 minutes. So if you're really racing, you can do this it, prep in about 90 minutes. And we put these two samples into the minion, uh, into, into uh, two different minions, one sample per flow cell. And this kind of shows the, is a collector's curve of the data. So this is the number of, a number of base pairs collected against time, and that, indicates 1x coverage of the salmonella genome, 2x coverage of the salmonella genome. So in both cases, we, were, we had 2x coverage of the salmonella genome in about 100 minutes. So, and, and if you uh, look at the read lengths, about one, the, they were sheared to slightly different sizes, so we've got about 6,000 bases in one sample and about 4.5 uh, four in the other one. So we, were, we wanted to analyse this in... Um, in a real-time fashion, so we, we, we binned the reads, this is retrospectively, we binned the reads into, uh, into uh, uh, read sets of increasing kind of 10 minute blocks, and then we, in this case, we wanted to just do a kind of um, gene identification method by mapping. So we, we took the Metaflan database, which is a, a database of um, taxon uh, identifying genes, which is used for metagenomic classification, and we converted it into a uh, last um, reference, a uh, last database, and used the last liner to, to map the reads against it. And you can see these taxon defining genes coming up here. You can see that it's uh, Salmonella and Salmonella ent enterica defining in both in both cases that comes up. And what we weren't expecting to see is that you can already from this from this approach distinguish the non outbreak from the outbreak strain because they have different um, chromosomally encoded phages. Uh, you can see that one has um, this ST64B uh, and uh, this one, and the other one has this RE2010. So you can, already, uh, you can already identify them as being different from this method. We wanted to do something, uh, we wanted to try another method as well. Yeah. We wanted to use uh, this method, which we'd previously used for, for low coverage and or incomplete data called phylogenetic placement, which is where you can make a guide tree of uh, of of, ref, of of gene, of of reference to, uh, from existing genomes, and then you take your incomplete or kind of noisy sample, and you can probabilistically place it onto the tree. So what we what we did was we aligned. So I made this this tree here of, of all the different um, reference genomes that are available in RefSeq, all serovars of of Salmonella, and then. I aligned our nanopore reads to the to this reference genome, and extracted the genotype at each variant position, and then made a kind of 
concatenated them into a string and then use this pr uh, program pplacer to assign probabilistically the location on this reference tree. And you can see that if you do that for the 10 minute reads, 20, 30, 40, 50 minute reads, you can see that even after 10 minutes, you know that it's part of this galanor uh, galanorum pelorum uh, enterity, this kind of uh, clade. But as time goes on, you can see that actually it refines down to just enteritidis. So this was after about 40 minutes, you can identify the serobar using this kind of phylogenetic placement method. Interestingly, the, all of these are associated with uh, chickens. The Gallinarum and Pelorum um, are common kind of commensals in chickens. Um, but Enteritidis is the, is, is, the, is the human pathogen's most common cause of food poisoning. And we wanted to see if we could do this in finer detail. So went back to the uh, went back to the public health database and got them to draw an enormous tree of of hundreds of, of Salmonella isolates, and this would say that we could so that we could then assign the outbreak and the non-outbreak to that tree. So I did exactly the same method, um, aligned it to the to the reference genome, extracted the uh, the genotypes of those variant positions, and placed them onto the tree. And you can see that at 10, 20, 30, 40, it's starting to refine. You can kind of see from the beginning that it, 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 it looks like they're going to be, they look like they're going to be separate, but then there's a bit of noise coming in from a few false positives. Um, this is, you've got to remember that we're, I'm only using, I only had 2x coverage to play with, with, you know, 80% accuracy reads. So there's going to be a few false positive snips. And, but, the, but this pplacer ML algorithm does a really pretty good job of finding the fact that this sample belongs to this uh, this phage type 14b cluster, which is indeed the correct position um, of all the other outbreak strains that we sequenced on the MySeq, and the uh, other one was actually was was uh, unrelated and appears down a different part of the tree. So that method worked. So I'm going to talk a bit about de novo assembly. Lots of people want to know. Lots of people want to know. Can I? De novo assemble my organism using nanopore. Um, hopefully, yeah, I can convince you. Yes, that's the answer. So, Jared Simpson, uh, who wrote string, who wrote SGA and uh, Abyss, um, is a collaborator with us on this project. So he took the we generated four runs worth of E. coli data set, which represented 30x coverage of, of E. coli K12. And he generated, he came up with this. We had a hackathon with with Sam. Uh, and in in, um, in Cambridge, and we and we came up with this. We had this little a uh, little working group working on on uh, nanopore assembly, uh, to just de novo nanopore assembly. It was, it, people had already released a kind of scaffolded Illumina assembly at this point, but we just wanted to do pure de novo. And uh, and we came up with this pipeline, which is pretty similar to the Pat Bio assembly pipeline, which is called HGAP hierarchical genome assembly pipeline. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which involves taking your kind of raw error-prone reads, doing um, error correction on those reads by um, pairwise aligning all the reads to each other, finding the uh, finding the overlaps, doing error correction, assembling them with something like Celera, which is designed for long reads. Uh, it's, it's like an overlap layout consensus assembler, uh, and then somehow remapping your raw reads to that assembly and polishing it in some way to get your to get your final assembly. So we got these four runs that I did. You can see that they're they're kind of they're all R seven three runs, but you, you get this variation in quality. The, you can see that there's two runs which uh, got about eighty five percent identity, and then there's a kind of medium. There's a couple of ones that are slightly worse than that. So the first challenge is finding the overlaps for those um, reads because you're aligning two reads with you know twenty percent error to each other. So it's 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 um, fairly low similarity. Um, and the way that we do that is with Gene Myers tool D-Aligner, uh, which is which is um, which is part of his new uh, Pat Bio uh, fast Pat Bio assembler, which has not been released yet. But um, this also works with uh, Adam Philippi's um, Minhash uh, error corrector, which is actually part of Celera anyway. And so you can run Celera out of the box and get a single contig assembly from, from this data set. And 
the way that Jared wanted to do this error correction is using um, partial order graphs. So you, you take your reads um, and you align them. You align them all to this graph uh, structure, and then you take the the maximum weight path through the graph, and then you call that your corrected uh, read. So this is quite good. Um, this is is very effective at, at error correcting reads like this, which have quite a random um, quite a random uh, error mode and if you take all of the reads there with their kind of uncorrected identity of just slightly over 80 percent mean identity of slightly over 80 percent you run them through one or two rounds of poa error correction you can see that you quickly get up to about 97 percent identity so you then put them into solera as i said and you you get a one contig assembly using this data set you can try it out yourself we've got GitHub repository, you can clone it and you can recreate this analysis. It gives you a single contig assembly uh, and you can see the, the residual error there. So it's 98.5% identity to the reference genome just from the just from assembling those those error corrected reads. So the next thing we that Jared wanted to do is to come up with this um, this hidden Markov model which uses the actual event data from the squiggles from the from the nanopore um, electrical traces uh, to to correct the assembly so he came up with a toolkit which takes an alignment and it goes back to the raw data that generated that base call in, in, in at each column and he extracts that um, he extracts that that current and then he has this uh, this model here where he mutates the reference and decides which reference is best supported by those um, events that, he's, that you've, you've got in your reads. So this is a very clever bit of maths, which um, Zam will explain to you after if you, if, you, <laughs> if you want to know more about it. So you take the draft assembly, um, this is the occurrence of, of, of KMAS, um, e and Y and X, so you should, if it was perfect assembly, you should have this orthogonal um, line and that's what you get with the draft assembly and then that's what you get with the the polished assembly so it's gone up by uh, he's removed one one percent of the uh, one percent of the not one percent of the error he's improved the assembly by one percent um, and if you actually look at the the camers you can see this is this is uh, the the most incorrectly called camers in the draft assembly um, and the red is the draft and the, and the blue is the reference. So you can see that in the draft assembly, we're very much undercalling these kind of motifs here on the left. Um, actually, um, after the polishing, you can see there's two there on the right-hand side, two motifs which have been actually slightly overcorrected. But all of these ones in the middle, really good. And then your residual error appears to be mainly these 5Ts and 5A motifs. Uh, and that is because the um, if you have a homopolymer homopolymeric stretch of DNA in the pore, uh, it doesn't actually generate any change in signal as it slides through. So this is what you would call a kind of systematic error, um, which is which is potentially um, mitigated by using the time that it took to to, to to the time domain. But in this analysis. Uh, the time domain isn't used; it's purely just the um, the transitions. So that's so that's um, that's more work for the future. So whilst Jared and Nick were doing all this, I was generating some more data, some more data sets. Um, we didn't really need to use four data four runs to get to get thirty x coverage. It's possible to get thirty x coverage with a single flow cell, and I was I was trying to do that, uh, and around the Around the time that we were doing this, Oxford Nanopore also changed the sampling rate to three kilohertz, which they found improved the, the data. And I was also experimenting to see what the impact of doing PCR versus sequencing native DNA would be. And if you see, I've done two replicates of, of native DNA here, two replicates of, of PCR, where you where you take your native DNA and you adapt, you, you ligate some, some, some PCR adapters and then you just amplify up the molecules so that you, you're actually mainly sequencing uh, synthetic PCR generated DNA in, the, in one case and you can see that there is an, an impact of, of using 
uh, synthetic DNA in the it improves the, in that it improves the accuracy by a few percent, and that is likely because of the absence of modified bases, which cause uh, unmodeled signal in the um, in your squiggles. So, I actually would recommend if people have very kind of um, difficult to sequence. Uh, organism with lots of modifications, things like that. The PCR approach actually works really well and I would definitely recommend it. Okay, so everyone will um, know about the ongoing outbreak of Ebola in West Africa. Uh, we wanted to <coughs> use the third unique property of the system, of the fact that it's portable, to see if we could do real-time um, epidemiology <coughs> of Ebola in West Africa. So we teamed up with the uh, DSTL port and down um, it, because uh, we, wanted, we wanted to uh, validate this approach using uh, RNA extracts and uh, obviously um, they've got the facilities to be able to do that down in port and down. So we, we developed this, two, we had two ideas of, of how you could do this. One was that you can generate amplicons using PCR, using RT, uh, reverse transcription PCR, uh, and sequence them. And the other idea was that you can do direct metagenomics. So you can take your um, blood extract, you can deplete all the DNA, and then you try and sequence all of the remaining RNA. And uh, depending on the abundance of Ebola, you should be able to pick it up with that second method. What we actually ended up doing was the first mm -hmm. one, mainly because... There's for lots of reasons, but mainly because it's, it was the most simple and it gave us the most coverage. So if you if you uh, imagine that you've got a large range of uh, CT values, so the, the abundance of Ebola in the in the uh, in the blood sample, the using amp using amplification meant that we were able to sequence a, a wide range of, of abundances rather than it being rather than the amount of data generated being tied to the abundance of, of Ebola in the actual sample. So this is the Ebola genome, it's 20K. Uh, these, are the, these are the genes. And we, develop, we, we designed these primers, which were overlapping 500 base pair primers all the way along the genome. And that's the, the, the toolkit that I took with me. So this was, this was the stuff. I've got. A, I made a list of all the things and all the reagents that I, that I would need for, to do this experiment. Um, packed up all the stuff into the, this Pelican case and these um, these polystyrene boxes. So this is the hardware. That's a PCR machine, a fluorimeter, a heat block. There's four laptops in there of uh, three min irons, and down here I had 25 flow cells um, and the the library preparation kits. Uh, and all the extra reagents that you needed to do that. And then I had all the plasticware and tips and pets and all the other little bits and pieces that you need to be able to do the libraries. I packed it all up. And uh, so this, this part of the talk is mainly photos. So, so, so this is a picture of, of me at Heathrow. This is my luggage. That's the, um, that's the Pelican case there. And this is the, this is the holder with all the, all the cold chain reagents and all the plasticware in it. And this bag here is just my clothes. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I arrived in Guinea, the capital of Guinea, Conakry, which is, and this is this is Donk Hospital. It's the National Hospital of Guinea. Um, uh, it's you know it, 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 it's a very um, under-resourced and um, you know di a difficult environment to work in. Um, but I was I set up shop in in a, in a within the European mobile labs kind of infrastructure they already set up. So they gave me this, this, um, this bench here. Uh, you can see uh, that's all the stuff, basically. So I had a, a kind of couple of metres of bench space um, in this, in this um, lab, which was actually quite nice um, compared to all the other ones. Uh, and it had generator power, which, was, um, which, is, actually impor which, is, which is important because um, Guinea, uh, Conakry itself uh, Guinea as a country doesn't generate any electricity itself. It all comes cross-border. And uh, in the capital city, it's divided up into quadrants, and each quadrant would, uh, would only get power for a few hours a day. So one of the reasons that Minion is, um, is very useful in this, in, this, in this kind of setting is that it's battery-powered. It powers itself off the, off the laptop. So you get a few hours of sequencing, it, even with no power. I actually um, 
did need to back up the, the generator um, power supply because I was using a PCR to amplify the um, amplify the uh, the DNA from the um, RNA extracts, and I had a few other bits and pieces as well which needed power, like the fluorometer. So, um, so I got the I made I made some some first the the, the first the first attempt at, at a library. Um, I I wanted to initially just see how intact the RNAs were. One of the advantages of doing this kind of thing in Guinea is that the RNA samples are likely less degraded because they've been stored for less time, they've been tra tra haven't been transported, um, so and very fresh. So I put I did some tests. I tested uh, using a left primer and some increasing uh, different right primers to generate diff uh, increasing length products, and found that you could comfortably generate two kilobase amplicons um, and you could generate le less efficiently four and even six KB amplicons from these fresh RNA extracts. So, um, so it's it's an interesting approach where you're using long kind of RT-PCR and long read sequencing to cover a genome of 20 KB, and only about in in only 11 reactions I ended up using. So it's kind of a new uh, an interesting new new way of doing that you can that you could you can do these things with the MinIron. And this is just a photo of me. And uh, Dr. Masuma and Miles Carroll, who's the director of microbiology research at PHE at Port and Down, and he is a member of the European Mobile Labs, and he was the one that hooked us up. So able, I was able to go out there, and we're doing this. I'm wearing this WHO um, OMS, which is WHO in French, <laughs> in uh, um, Gilet, which is. Kind of a security uh, thing that you, you wear it when, whenever you're whenever you're out and about in Guinea, um, so that the so that the gendarmerie and the police kind of don't give you too much hassle, which they which which which, which did actually work pretty well. And uh, this is him starting the first uh, sequencing run ever in Guinea, uh, and probably not West Africa because there was there was uh, an American group doing this in Liberia, uh, but. Exciting, uh, nonetheless, and you can see the kind of uh, squiggles just starting to be generated there on the laptop screen. And this is just an artistic shot that I took <laughs> of of the uh, of the min iron there. Uh, it's that was the slightly older version. The new one they've kind of given it like Italian supercar styling now, so it looks even even better. And uh, this is the histogram of the reads and you know the, the data being generated on the screen there. So I had my first, the data for my first uh, genome, I hoped, I had to get it, and now I had to get it back. So what normally happens is you run a program called Metricore on the laptop, which sends and receives the, the data to Oxford Nanopore's cloud-based base caller. So it runs in Amazon Web Services, and you, you upload your raw data, it base calls it, and you download your, um, your base calls. Um, we couldn't do that because the, we, we didn't have a, a fast enough internet connection, we didn't have Wi-Fi, so we were relying on, um, initially, I took the data on a hard disk back to the hotel, so this was the kind of hovel that they made me stay in when I was out there. The, uh, the, uh, it's called the Palm Camayenne in, in Conakry, it's probably, it's probably the only five-star hotel in, in West Africa, but uh, so it was that was the uh, that was the PHE rules there, so I had to go there. And uh, I initially, I used the Wi-Fi connection, which which they had, which was a kind of very fast, expensive satellite uh, data connection. And I was and I uploaded the the raw data to Nick in in Birmingham, and he started working up uh, an analysis pipeline. Basically, after the first, I'd send him the first run. We realised that this strategy was working, and that we had pretty much covered most of the genome uh, at decent depth. And later on, I found this, uh, this, this is a WHO issue kind of hotspot, TP-Link uh, kind of wireless hotspot. And I tested out um, a couple of different SIM cards. They have orange there, and they have this MTN network, which, is this, which I found was, really, was actually quite good. Could get about two or 300 KB uh, second upload speeds from the, from the lab where I was working. And the funny thing was, in order to get a 10 gig top-up card, you had to top up with 170,000 Guinean francs, which was 17 top-up cards in a row. And then 
the, uh, so we, we're uploading with that. Later on, we tried this thing here, which is called a BRIC or BRCK. It's a rugged, basically a rugged hotspot with a kind of omnidirectional antenna attached to it. Um, it didn't really improve things, um, unfortunately. We also investigated a satellite link. This is an Inmarsat um, BGAN terminal, which is a kind of fast, kind of a data terminal, basically, which can it's supposed to offer about up to about 600 kb a second upload speeds from anywhere in the world, but these things turn out. It turns out these things are extremely expensive, and it's about uh, a pound a megabyte, something like that. So it was more expensive than the, than the sequencer, uh, than the sequencing consumables. When I spoke to them on the phone, they said it's cheaper than data roaming. This is a, a schematic of the uh, original. Um, in the first panel there, that's the original uh, test kind of validation data we, we gen that we used. So these are the primers, basically, for, for above is the left primer, and below is the right primer. Uh, when I got there, I tried these, this 19 reaction scheme, and um, <clears throat> later on got it down to 11 reactions, which was 1.5 or 2 kb amplicons tiling across the whole genome. And these are this is the first um, four runs that we did. So that's the validation data set at the top. Can see the, the kind of coverage is a little bit patchy, and these are the first ones that I did in Guinea. The quality of the sequencing is much nicer. Um, these really nice blocks of coverage all the way down. So this is coverage depth in Y. Um, you're looking at probably um, somewhere between 20 and 200 x coverage there, uh, and then this is the 11 reaction scheme at the bottom, and then I slightly tweaked it to fill in a gap which was which we'd left. So this bottom scheme, basically what I stuck with in the end, uh, and we had covered 98.5% of the genome using this method. We had heard anecdotally that this was actually a, more of the genome covered than some of the existing Illumina sequences which had been released, because they were generated not by amplification, but by this total RNA sequencing. There were a few, the coverage was a bit patchy in some of those samples, even when using HiSeq to get, the, get high coverage. So this is the first kind of six runs, the metrics that we that we were collecting for them. So I was transferring um, ten thousand reads originally, uh, initially, then five thousand, um, generating on the order of hundreds to two hundred, three hundred x coverage. Um, percent passing is means the number of molecules that were two D base called with a quality above nine, uh, Q nine. And this the mismatch rate there, we were getting below 10% uh, in, in some of these samples for mismatch rates, so um, you know, 91, 92% uh, accuracy uh, in, in, some, in one case. And this is just an example of a SNP to show uh, the, kind of ch the kind of challenge that you're looking at when you're to, to do SNP calling. So it's, it's, it's kind of pretty obvious that that's a SNP. Nonetheless, we wanted to make sure we were calling um, we were calling accurately the SNPs. So we we validated this using um, three methods. Uh, one of them was comparing it to um, an Illumina dataset, which we called the kind of truth dataset. Uh, another way we artificially mutated the reference to see if we recovered all of those um, um, mutations which we which we um, created. And in the third way, we used a beast analysis to to confirm that the latest samples had the expected um, number of mutations based on their time of based on their time of collection, all of those things look good. So we were we were pretty happy we were generating solid genomes. Um, this is a kind of collector's curve to show how quickly you can generate the, an, that 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 data to to generate those genomes. So you can get um, that kind of one to two hundred. 300x coverage in some cases from as little as 30 minutes of sequencing on the minion. And this kind of spread here shows you the kind of variation in your library preparation and the flow cell. So some libraries um, are more efficient than others, some flow cells are more efficient than others. So in some cases it took up to about an hour, but um, it was as little as you know 10 or 20 minutes um, in, in other cases. And the analysis um, and the, the entire kind of workflow that we came up with in the end was the RT-PCR um, pooling and then minion sequencing, which we're talking about 
about a day in the lab, uh, and then can upload the data, and then do base calling in about 20 minutes, five to 10,000 reads. Um, and then we use this margin align software, which was developed by Mitt and Jane and Mark Aikson's group um, in UCSD. And they basically wanted to optimize, um, they, d they developed this um, expectation maximization algorithm for, um, de for determining the, the, the true uh, estimation of the, the deletion, insertion, and substitution rates. And then they have this, um, this kind of local realignment method to optimize your alignments. And that kind of removes any aligner dependency or which you can introduce uh, from, from, your, uh, from your kind of mismatch and your uh, penalties. And then they've got this margin caller as well, which they use for their, for their paper in um, Nature mm -hmm. Biotech, which, where, where they assess the quality of the minine. And then we manually inspected the alignments to check that everything uh, looked good, um, generated a kind of naive consensus against the reference, and then, and then generated a tree. And we didn't call any SNPs in homopolymeric regions, even though there may have been a couple of potential ones. We just didn't, we just didn't feel um, confident in doing that. So we, so we didn't, didn't call any, um, any homopolymeric SNPs. Um, that takes about an hour. And what we saw, I did, I sequenced 15 genomes when I was there, and this is just a, a tree that we quickly knocked up to show that from from the publicly available data sets to show that that we evidently had two lineages circulating uh, in Guinea at that at that time. And then I'm going to come back to the epidemiology in a second, but. We we showed this we showed this data to the WHO and the um, and the the epidemiologists in Guinea and they were they took the bait and they were they were they were really excited by the by the data found it really useful and they actually funded um, the the uh, building of this lab it's like almost as good as the Broad but not quite so they put this kind of shed up and uh, got the got the uh, minions there. I, so I left all of the, I was there for two weeks, and then I left the, all of the reagents and all the hardware that I took there so that, they, that it could be carried on by um, members, other members of the uh, EM labs, the European Mobile Labs staff. So you can see um, all of the gear still there. And there's one advantage of doing sequencing in the field. Look at that amazing view from the lab. So that's the, uh, that's the, the jungle, um, in Koya, which is the which is an Ebola treatment center about an hour outside um, outside of Conakry, the capital city. So, <clears throat> this is a this is a visualization from an, an article that came out in Guardian this week, which is based on Miles's recent Nature paper, where he sequenced 180 Ebola genomes <clears throat> from Guinea and Sierra Leone through the middle of last year, and what he found was that the origin of the outbreak was in, in Kisadugu, Gwekadu area, and then it spread um, into uh, Sierra Leone, caused um, an absolutely enormous outbreak when it got to the urban center of, um, of Freetown, um, then came back into Guinea, um, Liberia, Mali, and the original um, type from the origin also had also stayed um, within um, Guinea uh, and kind of migrated from east to west. Uh, so they generated this tree, which shows the this first lineage A up here, which is very which is closely related to the origin, and then this lineage B, which is um, which is kind of spreading out as it as it kind of um, exploded. And this bottom group here is associated with, associated with the large outbreak in Sierra Leone. It's not very well covered, it's not very well sampled here because they had much they had m m many more genomes from Guinea than they did from Sierra Leone. But if you look at this website, which is created by um, Trevor Bedford and Andy Rambout, the this is about a thousand Ebola genomes that so represents about three percent of the uh, total Ebola cases from this outbreak. You can see that this the the coloured nodes there are the are the are the samples from Miles's um, Nature paper. So they represent. Mainly, um, <clears throat> they represent mainly this kind of uh, bit of lineage A, and then 
and then some of this, some of the quite closely related ones, but they're not really representing the larger um, outbreak in Sierra Leone. And our isolates are the the ones that are, sh are, the, are the nodes that are coloured in this picture. So what we discovered was that they had incorrectly um, assumed that as there were no more cases from Guinea uh, from the lineage A um, after July, this lineage had actually died out. But from the recent Ebola um, minion sequencing, which was you know a few weeks old, you can see at the bottom there that this lineage still persists uh, in Guinea to, to, to this day. And some of these samples um, are from last week. So I wanted to show you this website is available. I'll put the link up at the end. It's based on the it's based on the next flu um, website. It shows all the publicly available um, Ebola genomes to date. And this is another um, website which we've been using for displaying results um, from David Arneson's group. It's called MicroReact. You basically give it two files, um, a new tree and, um, and a CSV file containing metadata, and it will plot each case onto a map as an individual point, and it will display your tree with uh, nodes coloured according to their geographic location, and you can display all the rest of the metadata at the bottom there. And what we found is that there was actually the other incorrect assumption from the from the recent from the recent Nature paper that was that the borders were not as porous as as, as previously thought, and uh, actually from integrating this with um, Ian Goodfellow's um, results from from the uh, Sanger group from um, Sierra Leone, you can see that we have a mixing here of uh, Guinea and Sierra Leone isolates from um, across this across this um, southern border of Guinea there. And not only that, but the lineage A, uh, Guinea lineage A is also present in Sierra Leone because there's a, a nice letter at the bottom of the tree there. So that's, um, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. This, there's, there's a nice um, write-up of this story um, by, by Eric Chuck Hayden in, in Nature News. And um, there's someone doing some minion sequencing in the jungle there. I think that there's a few areas which we would we would we're, we're going to continue to work on. Um, there's some bioinformatics opportunities, uh, mainly around not, uh, around not being reliant on a, on an internet connection to do this analysis. So there's three possible kind of paradigms here. There's squiggle alignment, which without doing any base calling at all, you're you're literally going to align squiggles to squiggles. And you're going to call reference directly from, from call the variants directly from that. There's there's this other idea where you can align events to a reference genome, which is uh, a tool that Jared's built down here called Event Align, and that will align events to a base reference. And then there's the third option, which is that you could align bases to bases using some kind of homemade base caller, which you can run on your laptop, and then run Nanopolish. Um, so kind of bootstrap base calling followed by um, followed by polishing uh, to get to refine the alignment and then do base call and then do variant calling from that. So those are three possible things uh, that we're that we're working on. All of those aimed at you know being able to do this independently without without the need for an internet connection. And I've got quite a lot of acknowledgements, but there's um, the main ones there. So. And that's the website at the bottom there if you want to look at the uh, very cool <laughs> website by Trevor Bedford. Thanks. Thank you very much.